Because He could have just put us in the land of Eden. He could have just put us in this place and say, enjoy. You do what you do. I've made this place for you. You can fill it. You can enjoy it. You can roam through it. But God specifically, the Bible says, built this garden to the east of Eden. And He placed us there. A place where He could meet with us. A place where He could walk with us. A place where He could fellowship with us. A place where we could see Him and meet with Him. We had access to all of Eden. But it was in the garden where He met with Adam and Eve. Now our traditional understanding is that God placed us in the garden to work it. Which isn't wrong when you read it in the context of the Scripture as we read it right now. Genesis 2 verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So it's not wrong when your Bible says we were placed in the garden to work it and take care of it. But what I want to say to you this morning is that's not its original meaning. The reason why we have so many different translations of the Bible is certain scholars read the text, the original Hebrew, and they glean from it what they believe is most important, and they put it in their version of the translated Bible. And so when we read the original text in Hebrew, that sentence has a whole range of meanings. doesn't make this meaning wrong. It just means that's not all that God was trying to say. And so to fully understand the meaning of the Scripture, we have to look at the original Hebrew translation because the Bible as we read it was translated from Hebrew into Greek. And so the first Bible we had was a Greek Bible known as the Septuagint. Now I'm not going to go into that. That's another teaching. But the first Bible we understood was the Greek Bible that was translated directly from the Hebrew. And based upon that, they had a certain understanding of what Hebrew meant and what they believed that the Jews were trying to say through these messages. And then the Bible was translated into English and all kinds of different other languages. And then it was translated into different translations. And sometimes things get lost in translation. Would you agree? That's why when we as pastors, we prepare our messages, we look at a whole range of different Bible translations to get the full context, the full meaning of what God is trying to say. Because if you're just going to read from the King James or just going to read from the New King James or just going to read from the New uh, International Version, you're going to get a certain meaning and an understanding, which is not wrong. But when you get the total picture, you need to read sometimes more translations. So it's always good to have a collection of Bibles at home. Right now we have a U version, and that allows us to read many different kinds of Bibles. But I'm just trying to give you some context to where I'm going. Amen? Still with me? So we're getting a little bit of teaching here. So when we look at Genesis 2 verse 8, a very small word changes the whole construct of the sentence. In Genesis 2 verse 8, the author uses the word put, which in Hebrew means to appoint. It says here, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Still with me? He appointed him to the garden to oversee it. But in Genesis 2, verse 15, the word put appears again. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the word put in Genesis 2 verse 15 has a different meaning. It means to rest or be safe. Still with me? Of mid May? Still with me there in Facebook? And so when you look at this word put and you take it back to the original translation, what that Genesis 2 verse 15 was actually saying, and I'm going to read it now in my own words, in another way that you can read it is God put man in the garden to rest and be safe and to worship and obey Him. God put man in the garden to rest and be safe and to worship and obey Him. It has a totally different meaning than saying 
It's a place of work. Amen? Going somewhere, just stick with me. The foundation is important. Let's look at Genesis 3 verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Sometimes in Scripture, the Bible doesn't expressly say something. You have to conclude based on certain evidence and based on your experience of life and relationships and how we are as people to draw a conclusion to the actual meaning of the Scripture. And so from this Scripture where it says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, it says to us quite a few things about God and about their relationship with God. And so we can conclude that it was customary for God to meet with Adam and Eve in this place at this time of the day, in the cool of the day. It was a place where they would have fellowship with Him. Hence the reason for them hiding. Because we know they ate of the fruit, and their eyes were opened, and they were enlightened. And they became aware of their nakedness, and they hid themselves because they were ashamed. And they knew that they had this appointment with God. They knew that they had this meeting with Him in this meeting place in the garden. Why would they then hide themselves if they didn't know that they were going to meet with God? Hence the reason God asking, where are you? I have this appointment with you. I want to meet with you as we always do in the Garden of Eden. And they hid themselves. If you had an appointment with someone and they didn't show up, the obvious question would be, where are you? The obvious response would be to inquire, where are you? And so to say Adam and Eve were solely placed in the garden to work it and take care of it wouldn't make sense in the context then of Genesis 3 verse 23 where it says, So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground which he had been, from which he had been taken. How could work go from a blessing to a curse? The sole purpose of us being in the garden of Eden wasn't ultimately to work it. It was a place to meet with God. And out of that, we worked the garden with me? Garden of Eden was a place in which we had fellowship with God, in which we enjoyed all He had created for us, and in that we tended to what He had given us. The word Eden means delight. And so when we look at the Genesis account, the entire purpose of God creating Eden and planting a garden for us was for us to delight in His presence and in all He created. Eden represents, the Garden of Eden represents the first tabernacle. What is a tabernacle? It's a meeting place when you go look at the translation. It is a meeting place. It is a place where we gather. It is a dwelling place, the Bible says. And so the Garden of Eden represented the first tabernacle, the first meeting place between God and man. Over centuries, historians and scholars and geologists and scientists and geographers have tried to find the exact location of the Garden of Eden, also known as the Garden of the Lord. Although we've never discovered the exact location of this Garden of Eden, we can say with certainty that we know it was placed in Eden, and we know where Eden is based upon things the Bible says, and we've concluded, and scholars have concluded that the Garden of Eden is the promised land that God had always promised Abraham. Genesis 15, verse 18 to 20, it says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants I give this land. From the wadi of Egypt, that's a marker, a boundary, 
to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And so the Wadi of Egypt formed the border of the promised land in the southeast. And Euphrates River formed the border of the promised land in the northwest. Now when you read in Genesis, in the creation account, the Euphrates River is mentioned. The Tigris River is mentioned. And then there's the Gion and the Pishon, which we haven't to this day discovered where that river is. And they believe that that rivers were destroyed or moved uh, uh, or removed by the flood. But just based upon these two rivers, we understand that Eden was in those boundaries. With me? And so the promised land is actually Eden. We just don't know where the Garden of Eden is because if we could f figure out where the other two rivers are, we'd be closer to the Garden of Eden. Now, I believe, now don't quote me and don't say, some clever guy told you this, I believe that the Garden of Eden is in the area of the Temple Mount. That's just what I believe. But you can do your own research. Amen. And so why is this important? Why am I laying this foundation and giving you this bit of teaching about Eden and the promised land and what God spoke to Abraham? Why is this significant? You can never fully understand what God is doing if you don't understand His heart. Ever been in a place where you feel frustrated and unsure of what's happening in your life and you're not quite sure what God's doing? If you understand His heart, then you'll understand that He is good and whatever you're going through is good for you. But God's heart in the story is revealed when He specifically created a garden in which to meet with us. And everything He has ever done since then was to get us back to that place. Hence his covenant with Abraham. The promised land of Cana was where the original Eden was. God has always been leading us back to Eden. The place where we delight in him. The place where we meet with him. The place where we have fellowship with Him. The place where we enjoy Him. The place where we are fulfilled in Him. He's always been leading us back to Eden. Psalm 37 verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. King David, a man who had everything, he had a kingdom. He had wives and he had children and he had riches and he had a following and he had armies. And the one thing he said, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delighting in God and meeting with God leads to you finding the desires that you are truly after. The things that you think you're after right now aren't really the things that you're after. And the promise here from that scripture, the Psalm 37 is a promise. So when you make God the object, object of your delight, He gives you what you truly desire, spiritually and physically. Because there's an exchange that takes place when you pursue the presence of God. God can do no other thing but give you what you desire when you delight in Him. But we come to God for what we desire and delighting in Him becomes an afterthought. And so we have to flip it around a bit and say, I will find my delight in the Lord and out of that, He will give me what I desire. Because what you delight in, you invite in. 
I'll say it again. What you delight in, you invite in. That means that whatever you delight in, whatever comes with that, you are inviting in. So if you delight in the wrong things, you invite everything that is attached to that. And so all throughout Scripture, we see God making Himself known to anyone who would seek Him and respond to Him. We read of Abraham in Genesis 12, 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Land, a place, I will show you. To Isaac, he said in Genesis 26, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. Land, a place. Jacob, he said in Genesis 28, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. That place again. That place. God speaks to Abraham of the place. God speaks to Isaac of this place. And then God speaks to Jacob of this place, always leading us back to Eden. In all three of these meetings, the first meetings that God had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, He reminded them of this place that He had promised them. The place we once had with Adam and Eve, the place we lost. But God had never deviated from His original plan of having a special place where we could delight in Him and all He created for us. And so this is how He introduces Himself to Moses, the first man that would sit face to face and have conversation with God. He introduces Him in the following way. Then He said, in Exodus 3, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, who I promised this place, the God of Isaac, who I promised this place, and the God of Jacob, who I promised this place. And at this Moses, he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. And you can highlight that in your Bible. God hears your cries and God is concerned about your suffering still today. That is the God we serve. That is who He is. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out, up out of that land into a good and spacious land. Land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. There's that place again. See the theme? See the plan? See the heart of God playing out? Then he introduces himself to those that respond to him. And then he goes back to the plan. I have this place for you. I have this land for you. I'm taking you back to Eden. God's first encounter with Moses, he introduces himself as the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he reaffirms the promised land he had for his people. A place where they would meet with God. A place where they would be with God. A place where they would enjoy his blessing, his creation. Exodus 29, 46. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. That I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. God wants to bring us to a place where He can dwell with us, where He can be with us. That was the original plan with Adam and Eve. God desired to be with us. That's why He created us. That's why He created this place where we could meet with Him. And so He says again to Moses that I want to be your God and I want to be amongst you. I want to be with you and I want you to be with me. 
That's the heart of God. And so Moses gets it. And he has this conversation with God. And God said to him in Exodus 33, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. There's that word rest again that we saw in Genesis 2. Then Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Moses gets it. You know, we could go anywhere. We could pursue anything. But we won't do it without your presence, God. And so maybe this message should be a wake-up call to us and to say, you know what? There are many things that we could do. And there are many places that we can go. But are we doing it with God's presence? Are we doing it with Him? Or is it just about us? About our plans and our visions? And it's great to have these things, we should. But every time... The Israelites rejected God and rejected His presence. They ended up in the wrong place. They ended up in captivity. They ended up in slavery. And every time God comes and rescues them. Maybe your response should be this morning like Moses. If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. I'd rather not go if your presence doesn't go with me. And all throughout his encounters with Moses, God made it clear that he wanted to be known by his people, and that he wants to be with his people, and that he was leading them back to the place he first met with them. Because the nation of Israel saw every time that Moses left the camp, he set up his tent outside of the camp, they saw the presence of God. Joshua was there listening to conversations that Moses was having with God. And the Bible says Moses was a man who sat face to face with God, spoke with Him in the tent, a place of meeting. And so I guess my heart for you this morning is to find your own place of meeting with God, where you'll find everything you ever need because you delight in Him. And this is what Jesus came to restore in Matthew 1. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is translated God with us. Of all the names He could have been given, His name reveals the heart of God. A God who desires to be with us. John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He dwelt among us. If you don't get the picture, I'm not too sure what's going to help you get the picture but God's heart is to dwell with you. God's heart is to walk with you. God's heart is to be with you. And what I'm hoping to achieve this morning is to stir something in you that that will be your heart. That that will be your greatest desire to be with God. Jesus became God with us again as it was in the Garden of Eden. That's why everything and everyone that Jesus touched was restored to their original design. Back to how we were created in Eden. He restored them to their original state. A reset, if you want to call it that. He restored them. Every time he touched someone, it revealed the heart of God to be with his people, to help his people, and to restore his people. 
One of the things that Eden represented symbolically was a place of worship. It was a type of temple or tabernacle where God's presence was experienced by His people. You know the interesting thing that I've noticed now with Levi over this time is it doesn't quite really matter where we go with Him as long as we're there. Whether it's a five-star place, a six-star place, whether it's on the beach, whether it's in the bathroom, whether he's in the bath, whether he comes looking for you trying to have a moment in the toilet, he's just happy where I am. And so sometimes we believe that there's this place that we should be, the place of ultimate fulfillment, the place where you'll be most happy a place where you've maybe achieved what you wanted to achieve. And you think that once you get there, once you have that house, and once you have that car, and once you have that amount of money, that that is going to be okay. And those things are all great, and it's nice, and you have to pursue growth and increase. But when you get to a place where you are most fulfilled when you're just with God, that's the place where you'll find real joy. So as we go through the Bible, we see God coming closer and closer until we now become Eden, the place where God meets with us and we delight in Him. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple? Do you not know that you are the meeting place? Do you not know that you are the tabernacle? Do you not know that your heart right now is the garden of Eden? That's what He's trying to say to you. Because that's why David could say, if I make my bed in hell, there you are. doesn't matter where I am geographically. It matters where my heart is with God. And so your heart right now is that Garden of Eden. You are the temple. You are the tabernacle. You are the meeting place. Eden is anywhere you are with God. Eden is the place where you choose to meet with Him. Eden is the place where you choose to delight in Him. Eden is the place where you choose to worship Him. And so in closing, here's a question. Why did God give Eve to Adam? Why did He give him a bride? I want you to think about it for a moment before I give the answer. I'm not searching for the answer. Because Adam delighted in the Lord in the Garden of Eden, God gave him the true desire of his heart. Because why did Adam desire a wife? He knew nothing of a woman or a wife. The reason he desired a wife was because Adam was made in the image of God. And God desired to have a bride, His church. And that's why He created us to be His bride. And so God knew Adam's real deep desire. And so He gave him a wife. You know, the interesting thing when you read in Genesis 2, it's God that said, it's not good for man to be alone. And in the verses that follow, the Bible says God didn't send Adam a wife. The Bible says God sent the animals to Adam for him to name the animals. And in that, the Bible says, Adam wasn't fulfilled. There was no one to meet his need. I believe that's why today, as human beings, we have such a close connection to animals. It comes from Adam. But then God noticed 
that Adam wasn't fulfilled with having pets around. Amen. And we love pets and we should love our pets, love animals. The Bible says you can measure a nation by how it treats its animals. Psychologists that have studied serial killers have noticed there's a trait that they don't have a respect for life and it starts as children that they don't have a respect for animals and the sanctity of life. And so God noticed that this wasn't fulfilling Adam. He named all the animals and yet there was an unmet desire. But Adam's delight was in the Lord. And so the Lord gave him what his heart truly desired. And so you need to set aside all preconceived ideas and thoughts about what you think you desire and start delighting in the Lord. Because then He will give you the true riches. Then He will give you what you truly desire. And that is my heart for you. And that is my heart for us as a church. Is that our number one delight would be God. Yes, we will celebrate victories and we will celebrate growth and we will celebrate increase and we will celebrate all the things that we do. But my number one thing for us as a church is that I want us to delight in the Lord. And so I've taken us from Genesis and it's fitting to end into Revelation. 21 verse 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the meeting place, of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them, and be their God. There's a time coming when Jesus returns, and order is restored. and We inherit what God has promised us, that we will see God as I see you today, that you will see God as you see me today face to face, not symbolically or metaphorically, we will see Him in person and He will see us in person and that place is coming. But while that place tarries and while that place is coming, I say to you, delight in the Lord and you will find your desires met and you will find your life fulfilled because God's bringing you back to Eden, the place where He meets with you. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet this morning. Come on, every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. No one looking around. Just you and your God in the temple of your heart, your meeting place. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed there at home, as well watching, I really sense that God is saying to people, I want to meet with you. I really truly want to meet with you. And so that decision is up to you. God sent His Son Jesus to restore that relationship so that we might know Him and so that we could have fellowship with Him. The Bible says no one comes to the Father except through the Son. And so you need to be introduced to the Father. And the only way you can be introduced and have fellowship and connection with Him is through the Son. And this Jesus, who they called Emmanuel, God with us, wants to make His home in your heart. But you have to decide that this morning. It's not a decision made for you. It's not a default setting that you enter into. It's a decision that you make. I choose who I invite into my home. I choose who I invite into my place. And so you need to choose this morning whether you want to invite Jesus into your heart. Whether you want to have fellowship with this God whom I speak of. And He desires to be with you more than you would ever know, but you need to choose Him. And so maybe you realize this morning that you've never chosen this relationship. You've never chosen to delight in the Lord. 
And so you're not quite sure what you want, and you're not quite sure what the desires of your heart is. And I tell you this morning that once you meet Jesus, and once you surrender to Him and give your life to Him, you will truly understand who you are and what it is you were made for, and you will truly understand what it is that you really desire. Only then will you know, and only then will you understand. My life had no meaning until the day I met Jesus. And then I understood. I stood in a service much like this. And for the first time in my life, I understood. I understood what grace was. I understood what mercy was. But above all, I understood what love was. Unconditional love. And that's what God offers you this morning. He offers His grace. He offers His mercy. He offers His peace. But more than that, He offers His love, unconditional. If that's you this morning and you want that, then I want to pray with you. If that's you this morning, maybe you've lost that and you want that back and you realize God's leading you back to Eden, then I want to pray with you this morning. So if that's you, Maybe you're in this place. Maybe you're at home. Let us know online and say, I'm going to pray this prayer. And if that's you, just lift your hand and say, that's me. I want to pray this. I want this. Thank you. I see your hand. If that's you this morning, why don't you lift your hand there at home and say, yes, Lord, that's me. I desire back coming back to Eden. That's you in this place. One more time, just lift your hand and say, that's me. Thank you. I see your hand. God's leading you back into His presence. So while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, just put your hand on your heart. And we're all going to pray this prayer. Lift your other hand to heaven. And repeat this after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died and that you rose again to give me life, to restore my relationship with the Father. And this morning, I receive this life. I enter into this relationship. I thank you that all my sins are forgiven. I thank you that I'm washed in your blood. I thank you that I'm whiter than snow. I thank you that from today, I am a child of God. Father, help me through the power of your Holy Spirit to seek you and that I will find you, that I will delight in you. And I thank you. Because of that, you give me the desires of my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen and amen. Come on, if you pray that, come on, let's give Jesus praise this morning. Amen. Amen there at home on radio. If you prayed this prayer and you really meant it, please send us a message. Um, you can send us a message on Facebook or you can send us a message on YouTube. You can go to our website on crcpal.co.za. Send us a message, connect with us. We would like to walk with you, help you and send you something, give you a booklet that will help you in this journey. Amen. You can take your seat. Amen. As we get ready for the offering. And just a short offering. In Genesis 26, we see God speaking to Isaac. And He speaks to him of this land, this place that He's promised. And he says to him, stay in this land. But then he also says to him, sow in this land, and I will give you a hundredfold return. And when you understand the Scripture, it doesn't quite make sense for God to ask Isaac what he's asking him, because the land he was speaking of was a dry land. It was a deserted land. It was a land in famine. It was a land in recession. That's why Isaac looked to Egypt because Egypt 
was prospering and he thought that that was the place that God would prosper him. That was the place where he could take care of the needs of his family. And so God says to him, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abram. And then the Bible says, Isaac sowed in the land. And the Bible says in that very same year, he saw a hundredfold return. <coughs> Excuse me. And God can bless you where you are. You don't need to be in a certain place. You don't need to be in a certain country. God can bless you right where you are. But the requirement is faith. And so Isaac's faith was made visible by the seed that he sowed. And I understand that in this time it doesn't make sense to ask people to sow, but you have no other choice right now to sow but in the land of famine, in this land of recession, because God is not limited by a famine or a recession. God can bring you a hundredfold return. Isaac is not better than you. Isaac is not more loved than you. Isaac is not more favored than you. Isaac just heard God, and Isaac responded. What is the hundredfold return that you see? And so God's looking to your faith. God sees your situation. God understands your fears and your concerns. But God responds to your faith. And so in this time, the greatest thing that you can do, in a place that it doesn't make sense, I'm pretty sure Isaac stood in that desert, and looked all around him and thought, Lord, what do you mean sowing to this land? I'm pretty sure that's what's going on in your heart. My pastor, you understand it. This kid understand it. My heart understand. God knows. God understands. But he's not moved by your need. He's moved by your seed. And so you have to respond in faith, trusting that God will bring the return even in this dry land, even in this recession. And I promise you, you will see Him move on your behalf because you respond by faith. Amen? Come on, let's pray over our seed. Father, we thank You this morning that we can come. That even in this land of famine, in this time of recession, in this time of drought, Lord, You are still a God, Lord, that makes a way that seems to be no way, you're still a God that makes rivers in the desert. You are still the God, Lord, who brings a hundredfold return to a seed that we sow in a dry and thirsty land. And so I pray, Lord, this morning for your people, that they will recognize, Lord, that you are still God, and that you are not limited by their circumstance, you are not limited by their lack, Father. All you need is their faith. And I pray that faith will rise up in your people this morning, that they will respond in faith, Lord, and that they will see your hand, Father, your hand of deliverance, Father, your hand of breakthrough, Father, your hand, Father, of prosperity, Lord, your hand of opportunity, Father, your hand of increase. You are still the God of a hundredfold return. And so I pray you show yourself to be mighty in the lives of your people this morning. So we give you glory with our seed as we bring you worship with our seed, as we meet you with our seed. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Ushers, you can move swiftly, take up the offering. Amen. And just while they're taking up the offering, um, the office is going to be open this whole week for Dream Week. So we're going to meet here together from Tuesday evening. It's only evening sessions. So I encourage you, I invite you, just come. Don't worry about how many people will be here. We'll have overflow facilities, etc. But just come and be in the presence of fellow Christians. Be in the presence of fellow believers. Let's meet in this place for Dream Week. And we're going to try and make it special, as special as we can, so we can have a bit of a Dream Week experience. I know it's not ideal, but God will show up. And that's all we want. Amen. So Dream Week this week, from Tuesday evening to Friday evening. And um, we hope to see you here, so Wednesday evenings as well. Uh, home sales uh, gather either here, um, and we'll speak about that in the week, or gather together to um, be part of Dream Week at your homes. Amen.
Come and let's stand to our feet as we close off the service. Father, we thank you, Lord, for an amazing time in your presence, Lord. We thank you, Father, that this morning, Father, we will once again come to that place, Lord, where we meet with you, where we delight in you, where you are the only one and the only thing we seek, Father. We thank you, Father, that we leave this place with you, Father, and that we decide, Lord, that we won't go anywhere without your presence if you do not go with us. And so I pray, Lord, go with your people. I pray, Lord, that they will experience you, that they will know you, and that they will walk with you all the days of their lives. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen and amen. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you during the week for Dream Week. Amen. It's time to bring heaven to our world. It's time to bring the hope of heaven, the love of heaven, the faith of heaven, the joy of heaven, the prosperity of heaven, the health of heaven, the integrity of heaven to rule and reign on planet earth. We want to bring heaven's message that God is not against you. God is for you, that God has given us this glory in earth.